Today we have the Director of Engineering, Head of Perception at Waymo, a company that has recently driven over 4 million miles autonomously and in so doing inspired the world in what artificial intelligence and good engineering can do. So please give a warm welcome to Sasha Arnu. Thanks a lot, uh, Lex, for the introduction. Well, it's a, it's a pretty packed house. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm really excited. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to, to be able to come and share my passion uh, with uh, self-driving cars and, and be able to share with you all the great work we've been doing uh, at Waymo over the last 10 years and, and, and give you more details on the, the, the recent milestones uh, we've reached. So as you'll see, we'll cover a lot of different topics, uh, some more technical, some uh, more about context. But when I, uh, over the content, uh, I have three main objectives that, that I'd like to, to uh, convey today. Uh, so keep that in mind as we go through the, through the presentation. Uh, my first one is, is to give you uh, some background around uh, the self-driving space and what's happening there and what it takes to build self-driving cars, uh, but also give you some, uh, some behind the scene uh, views and tidbits on, uh, on uh, the history of uh, machine learning, deep learning, and how it, how it all came together uh, within the big Alphabet family uh, from Google to Waymo. Another piece, obviously, uh, another objective I have is to uh, give you some technical meat uh, around the techniques that are working today on, on our self-driving cars. Uh, so I think during the, the, the class, uh, you hear a lot, you've heard a lot about uh, different, different deep learning techniques, models, architectures, algorithms, uh, and I'll try to put that in a current hole uh, so that you can, you can see how those pieces fit together to, to build the system we have today. And last but not least, I think as uh, Lex mentioned, it takes a lot more actually than uh, algorithms uh, to build uh, a, a sophisticated systems such as our self-driving cars. And fundamentally, uh, it takes a, a, a full industrial project uh, to make that happen. And I'll try to give you some color, which, which hopefully is a little different from, from what you've heard uh, during the week. I'll try to give you some color on uh, what it takes uh, to actually uh, pan out such an industrial project in real life uh, and, make, and essentially productionize uh, machine learning. So we hear a lot of talk. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, self-driving cars. Uh, it's a very hot topic. And for very good reasons, uh, I can tell you for sure that 2017 has been a great year for Waymo. Actually, uh, only a year ago, in January 2017, uh, Waymo became its own uh, company. Uh, so that was a major milestone and a testimony to the, to the robustness of the solution uh, so that we could move to a, a product, productization phase. Uh, so what you see on the picture here is our uh, latest uh, uh, generation uh, self-driving vehicle. Uh, so it is based on the, on the Chrysler Pacifica. You can already see a bunch of sensors. I'll come back to that and give you more, more insights on, on what they do and how they operate. But that's, that's, that's the latest and greatest. So self-driving indeed is, uh, draws a lot of uh, attention and for very good reason. I personally believe, and I think you will agree with me, that uh, uh, self-driving really has, has the potential to deeply change uh, the way we look about mobility and the way we move people and things around. Uh, so only to cover a, a few aspects here, obviously, that uh, and, uh, I don't want to go into too many details, but safety is one of, is one of the, the main motivations. 94% uh, of US crashes today involve uh, human errors. Uh, a lot of those errors are around distraction and things that could be avoided. So safety is a, is a big piece of it. Accessibility and access to mobility uh, is also a, a big motivation of ours. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, the, the self-driving technology has the potential uh, to make it very available and cheaper for more people to, uh, to be able to move around. And last but not least uh, is efficiency, uh, ef collective efficiency. Uh, so not only we spend a lot of time uh, in our cars in, uh, in uh, long commute hours, I personally spend a lot of time in long commute hours, 
And, and that time we spend in traffic probably could be better spent uh, doing something else than having to, to, drive, to drive the car in, in complicated situations. Uh, beyond beyond uh, traffic, obviously, uh, uh, self-driving technology has the, the potential to deeply change the way we think about traffic, parking spots, uh, urban environments, uh, city uh, design. Uh, uh, so that, that's why it's a very exciting topic. So that's why we, ma we made it our, our mission at Waymo is to fundamentally to, uh, to make it safe and easy uh, to move uh, people and things around. Um, so um, that's a nice mission, and we've been on it uh, for a very long time. Uh, so actually, the whole adventure started uh, close to 10 years ago, in uh, 2009. Uh, and at the time, that, was, uh, that started under an, uh, the umbrella of a Google project uh, that you may have heard of uh, called uh, Chauffeur. And back, back, back in those days, uh, so remember, we were before the deep learning days, at least in the industry. And so really back in those days, the, the, first, the first objective of the project was to try and assemble a first uh, prototype vehicle, take off the shelf uh, sensors, assemble them together, and, and try to go and decide if self-driving is even a possibility, right? It's like, it's one thing to, to have some prototype somewhere, but is that even a thing that, that, that is worth pursuing, right? Which is a very common way for, for Google to, to tackle problems. So the, the genesis uh, for that work was to come up with a pretty aggressive uh, objective. Uh, so the team, the first uh, milestone for the team was to essentially assemble 10 100-mile loops in Northern California, around, around Mountain View, and uh, try and figure out, so for a total of 1,000 miles, and try and, uh, and see if they could build a first system that, that would be able to go and drive those uh, loops autonomously. So they were not afraid, uh, so the team was not afraid, uh, so those loops went through uh, some very aggressive uh, uh, patterns. Uh, so you'll see that uh, some of those loops go, go through the, the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is an area in California that, as you'll see, I'll show you a video, that has very small roads and, and two-way traffic and cliffs uh, with negative obstacles and, and complicated patterns like that. Some of those, uh, some of those paths were going on highways, uh, uh, so that, uh, and one of the, the, the busiest uh, highways. Some of those routes uh, were going around uh, Lake Tahoe, uh, which, is, uh, which is in the Sierras in, in California, uh, where you can encounter uh, different kinds of weather and, again, different kinds of roads conditions. Those routes were going around bridges, uh, and the Bay Area has quite a few bridges uh, uh, to go through. Though some of them were even going through a, a dense urban area. So you can see uh, uh, San Francisco uh, being driven. You can see uh, Monterey, some of the Monterey uh, centers being driven, and as you'll see on the video, uh, those bring those truly bring uh, uh, dense urban uh, area challenges. So since I promised it, uh, so here you're going to see some uh, pictures of uh, of uh, the driving. Uh, it's kind of working. Uh, so here, with better quality, so here you see the the roads I was talking about uh, on the mountain on the Santa Cruz Mountains. Driving in the night, uh, uh, animals crossing the street, freeway driving, going through uh, petals. That's the Montreal area uh, that is fairly dense. There's an aquarium there, a pretty popular one. That's the famous uh, Lombard Street uh, in San Francisco uh, that you may have heard of. Which uh, uh, and, and San Francisco always brings its unique uh, set of challenges between fog and slopes, and, and, and in that case, even uh, sharp turns. Um, so that was all the way back in uh, 2010. So those uh, 10 loops were successfully completed 100% autonomously uh, back in 2010. Uh, so that's uh, more than eight, eight years ago. So on, that, on the heels of that success, uh, the team decided, uh, and uh, Google decided, that uh, self-driving was worth, uh, worth uh, pursuing. Uh, and moved, uh, and moved uh, forward with the development of the technology and, uh, and testing. So we've been at it uh, for all those years and have been working very hard on it. Uh, historically, Waymo and, and, uh, and I think all the other companies out there have been relying on what we call safety drivers uh, to still sit behind the wheels, even if the car is, uh, is driving autonomously, uh, you still have a safety driver who is able to take over at any time and, and make sure that we have uh, very safe operations. 
And, and we've been accumulating miles and knowledge and developing the system, many iterations of the system uh, across all those, uh, along all those years. We reached a major milestone, as uh, Lex mentioned, uh, back, in, uh, back in November, uh, where for the first time, uh, we reached a level of confidence and maturity in the system that we felt confident and proved to ourselves uh, that it was uh, safe to remove the safety driver. As you can imagine, that's, that's a major milestone uh, because it takes a, a, a very high level of confidence to not have that backup solution of a safety driver to take over uh, uh, were something uh, to arise. So here I'm gonna show you a small video, a, a quick, uh, quick capture of, of that event. So that the, the video is from one of the first times we did that. Uh, since then we've been uh, continuously operating uh, uh, driverless cars, uh, uh, self-driving cars in the, the Phoenix area in Arizona to expand our testing. So here you can see, the video is playing. Uh, so you can see uh, our Chrysler Pacifica. Uh, so here we have members of the team uh, who are acting as uh, passengers, uh, getting on a packed seat. There's, you can notice that there is no driver on the driver's seat. So here we are running a, a um, car hailing kind of service. Uh, so the passengers simply press a button, uh, the application knows where they want to go, and the car goes. Nope, no one on the driver's seat. So we started with uh, a fairly constrained uh, geographical area uh, in Chandler, uh, close to Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we, we are hard working to uh, expand the, the testing and the scope of uh, our operating area uh, since then. So that goes well beyond a single car, a single day. Uh, not only we do that continuously, but uh, we also have a growing fleet of uh, self-driving cars that we are deploying there uh, all the way uh, and, and looking for a product launch pretty quickly. <coughs> So I talked about 2010, and we are in 2018, and, and we're getting there, but, but it, took, it took quite a bit of time. So I think one of the, one of the key ideas uh, that I'd like to convey here today, and that I will, uh, I will go back to uh, during the presentation, is how much work, and uh, how much work it takes to really take a, a demo or something that's working in the lab into something that you feel safe uh, to put on the roads, and get all the way. To that, uh, to that depth of understanding, that depth of perfection in your technology uh, that, that you operate safely. Uh, so one way to say that is that when you're 90% done, you still have 90% to go, right? So 90% of the technology takes only 10% of the time, right? In other words, uh, you need to 10x, right? Uh, you need to 10x uh, the, the, the capabilities of your technology. You need to 10x your team size and find ways for more engineers and more researchers to collaborate together. You need to 10x uh, the, cap the capabilities of your sensors. You need to 10x uh, fundamentally the overall quality of the system, right? And, and your testing practices, as we'll see, uh, and a lot of the aspects of the program. Right? And that's what we've been, that's what we've been uh, working on. So, uh, beyond the context of uh, self-driving cars, I want to spend a little bit of time to uh, give you kind of, a, kind of an insider view of uh, the rise of deep learning. Uh, so remember I mentioned that back in 2009, 2010, uh, deep learning was not really available yet uh, in full capacity in the industry. And so over those years, actually, uh, uh, it took a lot of breakthroughs to, uh, to be able to reach to, uh, that stage. Uh, and one of them was the algorithm breakthrough that deep learning gave us, right? And, and I'll give you a little bit of a, of a backstage view on, on what happened at Google during those years. So as you know, uh, Google has, been, uh, has committed itself uh, to machine learning and deep learning very early on. Uh, you may have heard of uh, the Google Brain, what we call internally the Google Brain team, uh, which, is, uh, which is a team fundamentally uh, hard at work to lead uh, the bleeding edge of research, uh, which is known, uh, but also uh, uh, leading the, uh, the development of uh, the tools and infrastructure of the whole machine learning ecosystem at, uh, at Google and Waymo uh, to essentially uh, allow many teams uh, to, to develop machine learning at scale uh, all the way to successful products. Uh, so they've been working and, and pushing, uh, uh, that the, the deep learning technology has been pushing the field in many, in many uh, directions, 
uh, from computer vision to uh, speech understanding to NLP, uh, and all those directions are things that you can see in Google products today. Uh, so whether you're talking Google Assistant or Google Photos, uh, speech recognition, uh, or even Google Maps, uh, you can see the impact of, of uh, deep learning in, in all those areas. And actually, uh, many years ago, uh, I was part of, I myself was part of the Street View team, uh, and uh, I was leading the, the, what, an internal program, an internal project that we called uh, Street Smart. And uh, the goal we had at Street Smart was to uh, use deep learning and machine learning uh, techniques to go and analyze uh, street view imagery. And as you know, that, that's a fairly big and, and varied corpus. Uh, so that we could extract uh, elements that are core to our mapping strategy and build, uh, and that way build uh, better Google Maps. Uh, so for instance, on that picture, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, a panorama, or a piece of a panorama uh, from Street View Imagery. And you can see uh, that there are a lot of uh, pieces in there that if you could find and, and properly uh, localize, would drastically help you build better maps. Uh, so street numbers, obviously, that are really useful to map addresses. Uh, street names uh, that, when combined even on, on similar techniques from uh, aerial views, will help you uh, properly draw all the, all the routes and, and, and give a name to them. And those two combines actually allow you uh, to, uh, to do uh, very high quality address lookups, which is a common query on Google Maps. General text, and more specifically text on business facades uh, that allow you to not only maybe uh, localize business listings that, that you may have gotten by other means to uh, actual physical locations, but also build some of those local listings uh, directly from scratch. Um, and, and, and more traffic-oriented uh, patterns, traffic, whether it's traffic lights, traffic signs, uh, that can be used then for, uh, for ETA, uh, navigation ETA predictions, and, and stuff like that. Right. So that was our mission. One of the, as I mentioned, one of the hard pieces to do uh, is to map addresses at scale. And so you can imagine uh, that uh, we had a breakthrough when we first were able to uh, properly find those uh, street numbers out of the street view imagery and out of the facade. <coughs> Solving that problem actually requires a lot of pieces. Not only you need uh, to find what, uh, where the, the street number is on, on the facade, which is, if you think about it, a fairly hard uh, semantic problem, right? What, what's the difference between a street number versus another kind of number versus other, other text? Uh, but then obviously read it, uh, because there's no point uh, having pixels if you cannot understand the number that, that, that's on the, on the facade, all the way to uh, properly geolocalizing it so that you can then put it on, on, on Google Maps. Uh, and so, the first uh, deep learning application that, that succeeded in production, and that's all the way back to 2012, that, that we had the first system in production, um, was really the first breakthrough uh, that we had uh, uh, across, across uh, Alphabet on our ability to properly understand uh, real scene uh, uh, situations. So here I'm going to show you a, a video that kind of sums it up. Um, so look, uh, every one of those segments is actually a view uh, from the, starting from the car, going to the physical number of, of all those house numbers uh, that, that we've been able to detect and transcribe. So here that's in Sao Paulo, and where you can see that when all that data is put together, it gives you a very uh, consistent uh, uh, view of the addressing scheme. So, in a, in a, so that's another example, uh, say similar things. So obviously we have more, that's in Paris. Uh, where we have even more imagery, so more uh, views of those uh, of those physical numbers that when you if you're able to triangulate, uh, you're able to to localize them very accurately and have very accurate maps. So the last example uh, I'm going to show uh, is in uh, Cape Town uh, in South Africa, where again uh, the impact of that deep learning work uh, has been uh, huge in, in in terms of quality. So uh, many countries today. Uh, actually have up to more than 95% of addresses mapped, uh, mapped uh, that way. So doing similar things. Uh, so obviously you can see a lot of parallelism uh, between that work on street view imagery and, and doing, doing the same uh, on the real uh, scene on the car. Uh, but obviously uh, doing that on the car is even harder. It's even harder because uh, you need to do that real time and, uh, and uh, very quickly with low latency. And uh, you also need to do that in, uh, in an embedded system, right? So the cars have to be 
uh, 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 entirely autonomous. Uh, you cannot rely on a connection to a Google data center, and, and, and first you wouldn't have the time in terms of latency to bring data back and forth. But also you cannot rely on a connection to, for the safe operation of your system. Right? So you need to do the processing uh, uh, within the car. But very, so that's a, that's a paper that, that, that uh, you can read uh, that dates all the way back to 2014, where for the first time by, by using slightly different techniques, uh, we were able to put uh, deep learning at work inside, inside that, that constrained real-time uh, environment and start to have impact, uh, and in that case, around the pedestrian uh, detection. So as I said, there are a lot of uh, analogies. Uh, you can see that to properly drive that scene, uh, like Street View, you need to find, uh, you need to see the traffic light. Uh, you need to understand if the light is red or green, and that's what that's what essentially will allow you to uh, to do that processing. Obviously, driving is even more challenging uh, beyond the real time. I know if you saw the cyclist going through, uh, so you have real stuff happening real, uh, on the scene that you need to detect and properly understand, interpret, uh, and predict. Uh, and at the same time, here express, uh, I explicitly took a night driving example to show you that uh, while you can choose when you take pictures of Street View and do it in, in, in daytime and, and in, in perfect conditions, driving requires you to, to take the conditions that they are, and, and you have to deal with it. So there has been, for, uh, from the very early beginning, uh, there has been a lot of uh, cross panelization uh, between the, the real scene work. So here I, I took a, a, a few papers uh, that we did in Street View that obviously, if you read them, you'll see directly apply uh, to some of the stuff we do on the cars. Uh, but obviously, that collaboration between uh, Google Research and Waymo historically went well beyond uh, Street View only uh, and across all the research groups. And that still is a very strong collaboration going on uh, that enables us to, be, uh, to stay on the bleeding edge right, of, of, of what we can do. So now that we, we looked a little bit at, at how uh, things happened, I want to spend more time and, uh, and go into more of the details of uh, what's going on in the cars today and how deep learning is actually uh, impacting uh, our current system. So I think during the, uh, if I looked at the, the courses properly, I think during the week you went through the major pieces that, that you need to master uh, to make a self-driving car. Uh, so I'm sure you heard about mapping, localization, so putting the car uh, within those maps and understanding where you are with, with pretty good accuracy. Uh, perception, uh, scene understanding, uh, which is a higher level uh, semantic understanding of, of what's going on in the scene. Uh, starting to predict what the agents uh, are going to do around you so that you can do better motion planning. Right. Obviously, there's a whole uh, robotics aspect. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the car, in many ways, uh, acts like a robot, whether it's uh, around the sensor data or even the, the control interfaces to the car. Uh, and uh, for everyone who has, who has dealt with hardware and robotics, yeah, you will uh, agree with me uh, that, that it's not a perfect world and, and you need to deal with, uh, with, the, with the, those errors. Um, other pieces that you may have talked about is around uh, simulation and essentially uh, validation of, of whatever system you put together. So obviously, uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning have been having a, a deep impact in a, in a, in a growing uh, set of those areas. But for the next, uh, for the next uh, minutes here, I'm going to focus more on the, on the perception piece, uh, which, is, which is a core element of, of what a self-driving car needs to do. So what is, what is perception? So fundamentally, perception is a, is a system in the car uh, that needs to build uh, an understanding of the world around, around it. Right? And it does that uh, using two major inputs. The first one is uh, prior on the scene. Uh, so, for instance, to give you an example, it would be a little silly to, to have to recompute uh, the actual location of the road, uh, the actual uh, interconnectivity of the intersections of every intersection when you, once you get on the scene, because those things you can pre-compute. You can uh, pre-compute in advance and, and save your onboard computing uh, for other tasks that are more critical. Uh, so really, uh, uh, so that's often referred to as, uh, as the mapping exercise, but really it's about uh, uh, reducing the computation you're going to have to do uh, on, uh, on the car once, once it drives. The other big input, obviously, uh, is what sensors are going to give you once you get on the spot. 
So sensor data is the, is the, the signal that's going to tell you what is not like uh, what you mapped. And the things, is the traffic light red or green? Where, uh, where are the pedestrians? Where are the cars? What are they doing? So as we saw on the initial picture, uh, we have quite a, uh, a set of sensors on, on our uh, self-driving cars. Uh, so they go from uh, vision systems, radar, uh, and LIDAR are the other three big uh, families of, of sensors we have. One point to note here is, is that they are designed to be complementary. Right? So they are designed to be complementary first in their, in their localization on the car, uh, so we don't put them in the same spot, uh, because obviously blind spots is, is, is a major issue, and, and, uh, and you want to have a good uh, coverage of, of the field of view. The other piece is that they are complementary in their capabilities. Right? So for instance, to give you an example, uh, uh, cameras are going to be very good to give you a dense representation. Right? It's like it, it, it's a very dense uh, set of information. It contains a lot of semantic information, right? You can, you can see, uh, you, you can really see a big number of, a, a large number of details. Uh, but for instance, they are not really good to give you depth, or it's much harder uh, computer, uh, and computationally expensive to get uh, depth information out of uh, camera systems. Right? So systems like uh, LiDAR, for instance, will give you very good, very good uh, when, you hit, when you hit objects, will give you a very good uh, depth estimation, but obviously they're going to lack a lot of the semantic information that you will find on camera systems. So all those sensors are designed to be complementary uh, in terms of their capabilities. Right? It goes without saying that the better your sensors are, uh, the, the, the better your perception system is going to be. Right? So that's why at Waymo, we, we took the path of uh, designing our own sensors in-house and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and enhancing uh, what's uh, available uh, off the shelf today because uh, it's it important for us uh, to, to go all the way to be able to build a, a self-driving system that we could believe in. <laughs> and so uh, that's what perception does. Takes those two inputs uh, and build uh, a representation of the scene. Right? So at the end of the day, uh, you have to realize that, that uh, in nature, that work of perception is really what differentiates, deeply differentiates, what you need to do in a self-driving system as opposed to a lower, a lower level uh, driving assistance uh, system. In, ma in many cases, uh, for instance, if you do speed, speed cruise or if you do a lot of lower, lower level uh, driver assistance, uh, a lot of the strategies can be around uh, not bumping into things. <laughs> if you see things moving around, you, you group them, you segment them appropriately in, in blocks of moving things and you don't hit them, you're good enough in most cases. Right? Uh, when you don't have a driver on the driver's seat, obviously the challenge uh, totally changes scale. Uh, so to give you an example, for instance, uh, if, you're, if you're on a lane and, and you see a bicyclist uh, going more slowly on the, right, on, the, on, the, on the lane right of you and there's a car next to you, you need to understand that there's a chance that that car is going to want to avoid uh, that bicyclist, is going to swerve, and you need to anticipate that behavior uh, so that you can, you can uh, properly decide whether you want to slow down, give space for the car, or speed up and have the car go behind you. Those are the kinds of behaviors that go well beyond uh, not bumping into things um, uh, and that require a much deeper understanding of uh, the, the world that going, that's going on around you. Um, so let me put it in picture and, and we'll come back to that example in a couple of cases. So here is a typical scene uh, that we encountered, at least. Uh, so, um, uh, so here, obviously, you have a police car pulled over, uh, probably pulled over someone there. You have a cyclist on the road uh, moving forward, and we need to drive through that, that situation. Um, so the first thing you can do, you have to do, obviously, is the basics. right? So uh, out of your sensor data, understand that uh, a set of point clouds and pixels belong to the cyclist. Uh, uh, and find that you have two cars on the scene, the police car and the car uh, parked in front of it. Understand the, the policeman as a pedestrian. Um, so basic level of understanding. Obviously, you need, you need a little more than that. Uh, you need to go deeper in, in your semantics. Um, 
Obviously, you need, uh, if you understand that the, the flashing lights are on, uh, you understand that the police car is, is becoming an EV uh, and, and is performing something uh, on the scene. If you understand that this car is parked, obviously that's a valuable piece of information that's going to tell you uh, whether you can pass it or not. Something you have not noticed uh, is that there are also cones. Uh, so there are cones here on the scene uh, that would prevent you, for instance, to go and, and drive that pathway if you wanted to. Next level of, uh, of uh, getting closer to behavior prediction, obviously if you, if you also understand that actually the, the police car has an open door, then all of a sudden you can start to expect a behavior where someone is going to get out of that car, right? And, and the way you swerve, even if you were to decide to swerve, or the way uh, someone getting out of that car would impact the trajectory of the cyclist is something you need to understand uh, in order to uh, properly and safely drive. And only then, only when you have that, that depth of understanding, you can start to come up with realistic uh, uh, behavior predictions and trajectory predictions for all those agents in the, in, in, on the scene so that you can uh, come up with a proper strategy uh, for your planning control. Um, so, so how is uh, deep learning uh, playing into uh, that whole space? And how is uh, deep learning impacting uh, used uh, to solve uh, many of those problems? So remember when I said when you're 90% down, you, you still have 90% to, to go? So I think that, start, that starts to beat us. I also talked about how robotics uh, and, and having sensors in real life is not a, a perfect world. So actually, it is a big piece of the puzzle. So uh, I wish uh, sensors would give us perfect data all the time and would, uh, would give us a perfect picture that we can do reliably use to do a deep learning. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. So uh, here, for instance, uh, you see an, an example where uh, you have a pickup truck. Uh, so the, the imagery doesn't show it, but you have uh, smoke coming off the, out of the exhaust. And you have uh, exhaust that's triggering uh, uh, lidar laser points. Right? Not very relevant for uh, your for any behavior prediction or for your driving behavior. So those points, obviously, and, and it's safe to to go and drive through them. Right? So those are, are very safe to uh, to ignore uh, in terms of uh, scene understanding. Right? So uh, filtering the whole a whole bunch of data coming off your sensors. Is, uh, is a very important task because that reduces the computation you're going to have to do, uh, but also key uh, uh, to, do, to operate uh, safely. A more, sub a more uh, sub subtle one, but important one, are around reflections. Right? So here we, we are driving a scene. Uh, there's, a, there's a car here. On the camera picture, the car is reflected in a bus. And if you just do naive detection, you're gonna, especially that if the bus uh, goes, mo moves along with you and everything moves, which is very typical, and everything moves, then you're gonna have, all of a sudden, you're gonna have two cars on the scene. And, and if you take that car too seriously, uh, all the way to impacting your behavior, obviously you're gonna make mistakes, right? Uh, so here I showed you uh, an example of, uh, of uh, reflections on the, on the, on the visual range. Uh, but obviously that affects all sensors in slightly different manners. Uh, but you could have the same effect, for instance, uh, with uh, LiDAR data, where, uh, for instance, you drive, you drive a freeway and you have a road sign on top of the freeway uh, that will reflect uh, in the back window of the car in front of you, right? And then showing uh, a, a reflected sign on the road. Right? You'd better understand that the thing you see on the road uh, is actually your reflection and not try to swerve around and trying to avoid that thing on the, on the 65 uh, miles per hour uh, trajectory. So that's a big, that's a big complicated challenge. Uh, but assume we, we are able to get to a, a proper uh, sensor data that we can start to process uh, with our machine learning. Um, uh, so by the way, a lot of the, a lot of the, the signal processing uh, PCs actually already use uh, machine learning and deep learning to, because as you can see, for instance, in the reflection space, uh, you need to, at the end of the day, you can do some tricks to understand the difference in the signal, but at the end of the day, at some point, for some of them, you're gonna have to understand, to have a higher level of understanding of the scene and realize it's not possible uh, that the car is hiding behind the bus, uh, given my field of view, for instance. But assuming you have good uh, sensor data, filtered out uh, sensor data, 
The very next thing you're going to want to do uh, is uh, typically uh, is uh, uh, apply some kind of uh, of uh, uh, convolution uh, uh, layers on top of that uh, of that uh, imagery. So, for the if you're not familiar with convolution layers, uh, so that's uh, uh, that's a very popular way uh, to do computer vision uh, because it relies on. Uh, on connecting neurons uh, with kernels uh, that are going to run, uh, that are going to learn uh, uh, layer after layer uh, features of the imagery, right? So those kernels typically work locally on this on this on the sub region of the image, uh, and they're going to understand uh, 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 they're going to understand lines, they're going to understand contours, and as you build up layers, are going to understand higher and higher uh, uh, levels of uh, feature representations that ultimately will tell you what's happening on the on the image. Right? So that's a very common technique uh, and much more efficient, obviously, than fully connected layers, for instance, that wouldn't work. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the state of the art is actually in uh, 2D convolutions. Right? So again, they've been developed on, uh, on imagery. Uh, and uh, typically, uh, they require a fairly dense input. Right? So for imagery are great, is great because pixels are very dense. So you, you always have a pixel next to the next one. There's not a lot of void. Uh, if you were, for instance, to think if you were to, uh, to do uh, plane convolutions on, uh, on a very sparse uh, laser points, for instance, then you would have a lot of holes, and those don't work nearly as well. So typically, uh, what we do is to first project uh, sensor data into 2D planes uh, and, and do processing on those. So two very typical views that we use. The first one is, is uh, top-down, uh, so bird views, which, which is going to give you a Google Maps kind of view of the scene. Um, so it's great, for instance, to, to, map, up, to map cars and, and map uh, objects moving along, along the scene. Uh, but they don't, it, it's harder to put uh, imagery, pixels, uh, imagery you, you saw from the car in, into those uh, top-down views. Uh, so there's another famous one, uh, common one, uh, that, that is the driver view. Uh, so projection onto the, the plane uh, from the driver, driver's perspective. Uh, that are much better at uh, utilizing uh, imagery uh, because essentially that's how imagery imagery got captured. Right? They, we didn't use drones. <laughs> uh, so here, for instance, you're going to see how you can, uh, if if your sensors are properly registered, how you can use both uh, lidar and uh, uh, imagery uh, signals together uh, to better understand the scene. Uh, so the first uh, uh, the first kind of processing you can do. Is, uh, is, uh, is what is called uh, segmentation. Um, so once you have pixels or laser points, you need to group them together into, together into objects that you, can, uh, that you can then use uh, for better understanding and processing. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the objects you encounter uh, while driving don't have a predefined uh, shape. Uh, so here I took the example of snow, uh, but if you think about vegetation or if you think about trash bags, for instance, you can't, you can't come up with uh, a, 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 a prior understanding on how they're going to look like. And so you have to be ready to have any shape of those objects. Um, so the, one of the techniques uh, that works pretty well is to, uh, to build a, a smaller convolution uh, network that you're going to slide across, across your, the projection of your sensor data. Uh, so that's the sliding window approach. Uh, so here, for instance, if you have a, if you have a, a pixel accurate uh, snow detector that you slide across the image, then you'll be able to build uh, a representation of those patches of snow and 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 drive appropriately uh, around them. Uh, so that works pretty well, uh, but as you can imagine, is a little uh, expensive computationally uh, because it's like the uh, if for the if you remember if, uh, I don't know if you if you've seen them actually it's like the old ma the old matrix printing right it's like you had that printer and it had to go and and print the page point by point right so it works pretty well but it's pretty slow uh, so obviously uh, but but it's, it's very analogous to that right? but it works pretty well so so that works pretty well but you need obviously you need to be very conscious on uh, which area of the of the of the scene you want to apply it to uh, to uh, to stay efficient. Fortunately, many of the objects you, you need to care about have uh, predefined priors. So, for instance, if you take a car from the bird from the, the top down view, from the bird's view, it's going to be a rectangle. Uh, you can you can take that that shape prior into consideration. 
Uh, in most cases, even on the, on the lanes, on the driving lanes, uh, they're going to go in, the, in similar directions, whether, whether they go forward or, or they come the other way. They're going to go in the direction of the lanes, uh, same for adjacent streets. Uh, so you can use uh, those priors to actually do some more efficient uh, deep learning um, uh, that in the literature uh, is, is, con is, is conveyed under the ideas of uh, uh, single-shot multi-box, for instance. So, so here, again, you would start with uh, convolution towers, but, but you do only one pass of convolution. It's, like the, it's the same difference between a dot matrix printer uh, and, uh, and a press, right? That would print the page at once. <laughs> uh, so it's only an analogy, but uh, that, that I think that conveys the idea pretty well. Uh, so here you would train a deep, uh, a, a deep net that would directly take the whole uh, projection of your sensor data and output boxes uh, uh, that, that, that encode the, the priors you have. So here, for instance, I can show you uh, how such a thing would work uh, for cone detection. So you can see that we don't have uh, all the fidelity of the per pixel uh, cone uh, detection, but we don't really care about that. We just need to know there is a cone somewhere and we take a, a box prior. Uh, and obviously what, what that image is also uh, meant to show uh, is that uh, since it's a, it, it's a lot cheaper uh, compute, computationally, uh, you can obviously run that on a pretty wide uh, range of space, and, and even if you have a lot of them, uh, that's still easy gonna, that still is going to be a very efficient, efficient way to get, to get that data. So we talked about, uh, the, remember, the flashing lights on, to on top of the police car. Um, so even if you, if you properly uh, um, uh, detect and segment cars, let's say, on the road, Many cars have very special semantics. Uh, so here, in that, on that slide, I'm showing you many examples of uh, EV, emergency vehicles, um, that you need, obviously, to understand. You need to understand, first, that it is an EV, and two, whether the EV is active or not. So school buses are not, are not really uh, emergency vehicles, but obviously, whether the bus has lights on, or the bus has a, the, the stop sign uh, open on the side, carry heavy semantics that you need to understand. So how do you deal with that? Uh, back to the deep learning techniques. One thing you could do is, uh, is uh, take that patch, uh, build a new uh, convolution tower, and build a classifier on top of that. Uh, and essentially build a, a school bus classifier, a school bus with lights on classifier, a school bus with stop sign open classifier. Uh, I'm pretty sure that would work pretty well, but obviously that would be a lot of work and, uh, and pretty, ex uh, pretty expensive to run on the car, right? Because you would need to, and convolution, convolution layers typically are the most expensive pieces of, uh, of, uh, of a neural net. So uh, one better thing to do is to use, uh, to use embeddings. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, embeddings essentially are vector representations of uh, objects uh, that you can learn with deep nets that will, uh, that will carry some semantic meaning of, of, of those objects. So for instance, you, given, a, given a vehicle, you can build a, a vector that's going to carry the information that that vehicle is a school bus, whether the lights are on, whether the stop sign is open, and then you, you're back into a vector space, uh, which is much smaller, much more efficient, that you can uh, operate in to do further, further processing. Right? So those embeddings have been actually, historically, they've been uh, more closely associated with uh, word embeddings. So in a typical text, uh, uh, if you were able to build those vectors with word, out of words, right? so out of every word in a piece of text, you build a vector that represents the meaning of that world. And then if you look at the sequence of those words and, and operate in the vector space, you start to understand uh, this, the, the semantics of those uh, sentences. Right? So one of the early projects uh, that you can look at is called uh, Word2Vec, uh, which, was, uh, which was done in uh, the NLP group at Google, uh, where they, they were able to build such things. And, and, and they discovered that the, that embedding space actually carried uh, some interesting uh, vector space properties, such as if you took the vector for a uh, king, minus the vector for man, plus the vector for woman, actually you ended up with a vector where the, the, the closest word to that vector would be queen, essentially. Right? So, so that's to show you how those, those vector representations can be very powerful in the amount of uh, information they can, they can uh, contain. <clears throat> Let's talk about pedestrians. So we talked about uh, semantic segment, uh, segmentation, uh, remember, so the ability to go pixel by pixel. Uh, for, uh, for things that, that, that don't really have a shape. We talked about using shape priors, but pedestrians actually combine uh, the complexity of those, uh, of those two approaches for many reasons. 
One is that, they, uh, obviously, they are deformable, and pedestrians come with many uh, uh, shapes and poses. Uh, as you can see here, I think here you have a, a guy on a, uh, someone on a, on a skateboard, uh, crouching, uh, more, more unusual poses that you need to understand. Uh, and the recall you need to have on pedestrians is very high. And pedestrians show up in many different situations. So for instance here, you have occluded pedestrians that you need to see because there's a good chance when you, when you do your behavior prediction that that person here is going to jump out of the car. And you need to be ready for that. Um, so uh, last but not least, uh, predicting the behavior of pedestrians is really hard uh, because they, they move in any direction. A car moving that direction, you can safely bet it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's not going to drastically change <laughs> angle in, in, in a moment's notice, right? Uh, but if you take children, for instance, it's a little more complicated, right? Uh, so they may not pay attention, they may jump in any direction, and you need to be ready for that. Uh, so it's harder in terms of shape prior, it's harder in terms of recall, and it's also harder in terms of uh, prediction, right? And you need to have a fine understanding of the semantics to understand that. Another example here is, is uh, that we encountered is uh, you get to an intersection and uh, you have a visually impaired person uh, that's uh, jaywalking on the intersection. Uh, and you obviously need to understand all, that, all of that to know that you need to yield to that person. Right, pretty clearly. So, uh, person on the road, maybe you should yield to it, to, uh, to him. Uh, not that easy. Uh, so, for instance, here, uh, so there is actually, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's a real person or a, uh, a mannequin or something. Right? So, but here we go. Something that, frankly, really looks like a pedestrian, that you should probably classify as a pedestrian, uh, but lying on the, on, the, on, the, on the bed of a pickup truck. Uh, so, and obviously, you shouldn't yield. Uh, to that person, right? Because if you if you were to to and yielding to a pedestrian at 35 miles per hour, for instance, is is hitting the brakes pretty hard, right? And with the, with the risk of a rear uh, rear, rear collision. Uh, so obviously, you need to understand that 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 person uh, is traveling with a truck and is not uh, actually on the road, and it's okay to not yield to to him. Uh, so those are examples of the rich, uh, richness of the semantics you need to understand. Obviously, one way to do that is to uh, start and, and understand the behavior of, of things over time. Everything we talked about up until now in, in the, how we use deep learning in, in, to solve some of those problems was on a pure frame basis. But understanding that that person is moving with the truck versus the jaywalker in the middle of the intersection, obviously, those, that kind of information you can get to if you observe the, be, the, the, the behavior over time. Uh, Back to the embeddings. Uh, so if you, had vector, if you have vector representations of those objects, you can start and track them over time. Uh, so a common technique that you can use to get there is to use uh, uh, recurrent neural networks uh, that essentially are networks that will build uh, a state that gets better and better as it gets more observations, sequential observations of, of a real pattern. Right? So for instance, coming back to the, to the words example I gave earlier, uh, you, can, you see, you have one word, you see its vector representation, another word in a sentence, oh, so you understand more about what the, some, what the author is trying to say. Third word, fourth word, at the end of the sentence, you have a good understanding, and you can start to translate, for instance. Right? Uh, so here's a similar idea. Yeah, if, you, if, you understand, if you have a, a semantic representation encoded in an embedding uh, for uh, the pedestrian and the car uh, under it, and track that over time and build a state you, uh, that, that gets more and more uh, meaning as, as time goes by, you're going to get closer and closer to, the, to a, a good understanding of what's going on in the scene. Right? So my, my point here is uh, those uh, vector representation combined with uh, recurrent neural networks uh, is, is a common technique that, uh, that, that can uh, help you figure that out. Back to the point. When you're 90% done, you still have 90% to go. Uh, and so uh, uh, to get to the last leg of, of my talk here today, uh, I want to give you uh, uh, some appreciation uh, for uh, what it takes to truly build uh, a machine learning system at scale and industrialize it. Uh, so up till now, we talked a lot about algorithms. Uh, as I said earlier, algorithms have been a breakthrough, and, and uh, the efficiency of those algorithms has been a, a breakthrough uh, for us to succeed uh, at the self-driving task. Uh, but it takes a lot more than algorithms uh, to actually get there. Um, <clears throat> the first piece uh, that you need to 10x is, uh, is around uh, labeling efforts. 
Um, so a lot of the algorithms we talked about uh, are supervised, meaning that even if you have a strong uh, network architecture and you come up with the right one, uh, they are supervised in the sense that you need, you need to give, in order to, to train that network, you need to come up with a representative set, high quality set of labeled data that's gonna map some input to predict the, the outputs you wanted to predict. Right? So that's a pedestrian, that's a car. That's a pedestrian, that's a car. And, and the network will learn uh, in a supervised way uh, how to build the right representations. So there's a lot, uh, obviously the, the unsupervised space is a very active uh, domain of research. Uh, our own team of, uh, of research at Waymo and, and collaboration with Google is around, is around that domain. Uh, but today, a lot of it still is supervised. So to give you uh, orders of magnitude, so here I represented uh, in a logarith logarithmic scale uh, the size of a couple data sets. Uh, so you may be familiar with ImageNet, which I think is the 15 million uh, uh, of such labels uh, range. Uh, that guy jumping represents a number of seconds uh, from birth to college graduation, uh, hopefully coming soon. Uh, and uh, so that's, a, that's, kind of, that's more of an historical uh, tidbit. Uh, but the first, remember the, the find uh, uh, the, the, house no, the street number on the facade problem? Uh, so in the, back in those days, uh, it took us a multi-billion uh, label data set to actually teach the network. Right? So those were very early days. Today we do a lot, a lot better, obviously. Uh, but that's to give you an idea of scale. So uh, being able to put to have labeling operations uh, that produce large and high quality labeled data sets is key for your success, and that's a big piece of of, uh, of the puzzle you need to solve. Uh, so obviously today we do a lot more better. Uh, not only we we require less data, uh, but we we also uh, can generate those data sets much much more efficiently. You can use machine learning itself uh, to come up with labels and use operators, and, and, and more importantly, use hybrid models where you use labelers to, uh, to more and more uh, fix the discrepancies or the mistakes and not have to label the whole thing from scratch. Uh, so combining, uh, so that's a whole space of active learning and stuff like that. But combining those, uh, those techniques together, obviously, obviously you, can get, you can get to completion faster. It's very common to still need, though, uh, in the millions, millions range uh, kind of samples to, to train a, a robust uh, solution. Another piece is around, uh, Computation, compu computing power. Uh, so again, that's 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 kind of a historical tidbit uh, uh, around the, the street number models. Uh, so here it's uh, the detection model, and here is the transcriber model. So obviously, comparison is not is, is only worth what it's worth here. Uh, but uh, if you if you look at the number of neurons or number of connections per neuron, which are, are two important uh, parameters of uh, of any neural net. Uh, that gives you an idea of scale, right? So obviously, it's in many orders of magnitude away from what the human brain can do, but you start to be competitive, in a, in, and even in some cases in the in a, in a mammal space, right? So we, again, historical historical data, but the main point here is that you need a lot of computation, and you need a, you need to have access to a lot of uh, of computing to either train or and infer uh, those trained models uh, uh, on real time in the, on the scene. Uh, and that requires a lot of uh, very robust engineering uh, and infrastructure development to get to those uh, to those uh, scales. Right? But Google is pretty good at that, and, and obviously uh, we at Waymo have access to the, the Google infrastructure and tools uh, to essentially get there. Um, so I don't know if you heard. So the, the way the way it's happening at Google is around the TensorFlow. Um, uh, so maybe you've heard about about it as a as a more of a programming language uh, to program machine learning, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 encode uh, network architectures. But actually, TensorFlow is also uh, becoming, uh, or is actually, uh, the whole ecosystem that can combine, uh, combine all those pieces together and do machine learning at scale uh, at Google and Waymo. Uh, so uh, it's a, as I said, it's a language that allows uh, teams that allows teams to collaborate and work together. Uh, that's a data representation uh, in which you can uh, represent your your label data sets, for instance, or, or your training uh, batches. Um, that's a runtime uh, that uh, that that you can deploy uh, onto Google data centers, and you need you need uh, it's, it's good that we have access to that computing power. Um, another piece is is accelerators. Um, so back in the early days, when we had CPUs uh, to run uh, deep learning models at scale, uh, which 
is less efficient. And over time, GPUs came into the mix, uh, and, and, uh, and Google is, is, is pretty active into developing uh, a very advanced uh, set of hardware accelerators. Uh, so you may have heard about uh, TPUs, TensorFlow Processing Units, uh, which, has, uh, which are uh, proprietary uh, chipsets that Google deploys in its uh, data centers uh, that allow you to train and, and infer uh, more efficiently those deep learning models. Right? And TensorFlow is the glue uh, that allows you to deploy at scale uh, across those, uh, those pieces. Very important piece uh, to, to get there. So it's nice. You're, you're smart. You build a, we build a smart algorithm. We were able to collect enough data to, to train it. Uh, great, ship it. Well, self-driving system is pretty sophisticated. Uh, and that's a complex system to understand. And that's a complex system uh, uh, that, that requires ext extensive testing. Right? And uh, I think the last leg that you need to cover uh, to do machine learning at scale and, uh, and with a, a high safety bar is around your testing program. So uh, we have three legs that, that, we, that we use uh, to, to uh, make sure that we, our machine learning is ready for production. Uh, one is around real-world driving, uh, another one is around simulation, and the last one is around uh, structured testing. Uh, so I'll come back to that. In terms of real-world driving, uh, obviously, there is no way around it. Uh, if, uh, if you want to encounter situations and see uh, and understand how you behave, you need to drive. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the driving at Waymo has been uh, accelerating over time, uh, still is accelerating. So we crossed uh, 3 million uh, miles driven back in May 2017, and only six months later, uh, back in November, uh, we reached uh, 4 million. So that's an accelerating pace. Um, obviously, not every mile is equal, and what you care about are the miles that carry new situations and, and important situations. So what we do, obviously, is drive in, in many different situations. Uh, so those miles got acquired uh, across 20 cities, many weather conditions, uh, um, and, uh, and many environments. Right? It's for me not a lot. Uh, so to give you another of magnitude, uh, so that's 160 times around the globe. Uh, okay. Uh, even more importantly, uh, it's, hard to it's hard to estimate, but it's probably around 300 years of, of human driving, right? the equivalent. Right. So, so in that data set, potentially, uh, you have 300 years of experience that your machine learning can tap into uh, to, learn, uh, to learn what to do. <coughs> Even more importantly is uh, your ability to uh, simulate. Uh, obviously, the software changes regularly. Uh, so if for each new re revision of the software, you need to go and redrive uh, 4 million miles, it's not really practical. It's going to take a lot of time. So the ability to, uh, to have a, a good enough simulation that you can replay all those miles that you've driven in any new iteration of the software is key uh, for you to decide if, if the new version is ready or not. Even more important is your ability to, uh, to uh, make those miles more, even more efficient and tweak them. Uh, so here is a, is a screenshot of an internal tool uh, that we call a CarCraft. Uh, that essentially uh, gives us the ability uh, to fuzz or change the parameters of the, the actual scene we've driven. So what if the cars were doing in a slightly different speed? What if there was an extra car uh, that, that was on the scene? What if a pedestrian crossed in front of the car? So, so you can use the actual driven miles as a base uh, and then augment them uh, into new situations that you can test your drive again, uh, your, your self-driving system against. Right? Um, so that's a very powerful way uh, to actually drastically multiply the impact of any any mile you, you drive. And simulation is another of those uh, massive scales uh, project uh, that you need to cover. Um, so a uh, couple others of magnitude here. Uh, so using Google's infrastructure. Uh, we have the ability to run uh, a virtual fleet of uh, 25,000 cars 24-7 uh, in data centers. So those, those, are, those are software stacks uh, that emulate the driving across either uh, raw miles that we've driven or, or modified miles uh, that, that help us understand the behavior of the software. Um, so to give you another magnitude, uh, last year alone, we drove uh, 2.5 billion of, uh, of those miles in, uh, in data centers, right? So remember, 4 million driven miles total, uh, all the way to uh, 2.5, so that's three orders of magnitude right? of, uh, of expansion uh, in, your, in your ability to truly understand uh, how the system behaves. 
But there's still a long tail. Uh, there's a whole tail of, a long tail of situations that will happen very rarely. Um, so the way we, we decided to tackle those uh, is to set up our own uh, testing facility that is a mock of a, of a city and driving situation. So we do that in a, in a 90 acre uh, testing facility on the former Air Force Base in Central California uh, that we set up uh, with uh, traffic lights, railroad crossings, uh, I mean, truly trying to reproduce uh, a real life situation and where we set up very specific scenarios uh, that we haven't necessarily encountered during regular driving, that, but that we want to test. And again, feed back into the simulation, re-augment using the same augmentation strategies, and, and inject into our 2.5 billion miles uh, driven. Right. So here I'm going to show you two quick examples of, of such tests. So here, uh, just, just have a car back up as the self-driving car uh, get, gets closed and see what happens and, and use uh, all those sensor data to and re-inject them into simulation. Another example is going to be around uh, people dropping boxes. Uh, so <coughs> remember, try to imagine the kind of uh, understanding segmentation uh, you need to do to understand <laughs> to understand what's happening there and cementing understanding you have. And to make it even more interesting, uh, note that the car that has been put on the other side, so that swerving is not an option, right? No, no, without hitting the car. <laughs> Right? So driving complex situations that go from perception to motion planning, the whole stack, and, and make sure that we are uh, reliable, uh, even in those long time, long time examples. Are we done? <laughs> Looks like a lot of work. Uh, I wish, but no. <laughs> Actually, we still, have, uh, we still have a lot of very interesting work uh, coming, uh, so I don't have much time to, to go into too many of those details, but I'm just going to give you two big directions. Uh, the first one is around uh, growing our uh, what we call ODD, uh, so uh, operating uh, operating domain, operating design domain. Um, so extending extending our, our fleet of self-driving cars not only geographically. Um, so geographically meaning uh, going into uh, deploying into urban cores. Uh, deploying into different weather conditions. Uh, so uh, just as of this morning or yesterday, we announced uh, 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 that we, we're going to grow our testing in San Francisco, for instance, uh, with Waymo cars that bring uh, urban environments, slopes, fog, as I said. And, and so that, that's, uh, that's obviously a very, uh, very important direction that we need to go into and where machine learning is going to keep playing a very important role. Another area is around the cementing understanding. Um, so, in case you haven't, haven't uh, noticed yet, I am from France. Uh, that's, a, that's a famous uh, uh, roundabout in Paris, uh, Place de l'Etoile, uh, which seems pretty chaotic, uh, but I've, I've driven it many times uh, without any issues touching wood. Uh, but I know that it took a lot of semantics and, and understanding for me uh, to, to do it safely. I have a lot, I had a lot of expectations on what people do, uh, had a lot of communication, visual gestures uh, to, to, to essentially get it, get, get through that, that thing safely, right? So, um, and those require a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot deeper semantic understanding of, of, of the scene around to, for self driving cars to, to get through. So that's an example of, uh, of, uh, of a direction. So back to my objectives. I hope I covered many of those, or at least you have, you have directions to, for further reading and, and investigations on those, uh, those three objectives I had, I had today. First one was around context, uh, context of the space, context of the history at Google and Waymo, and, and, how, uh, and, and how deep the roots, uh, the roots are uh, all the way back in time. Uh, my second objective was to give you, to, to tie in uh, some of the technical uh, algorithmic solutions uh, that you may have talked about uh, during that class into the practical cases we need to solve in, in the production system. And last but not least, uh, really emphasize uh, the scale and uh, the engineering infrastructure work uh, that needs to happen to really take uh, such a project uh, into, uh, into attrition in, in, a, in a production system. Last treat. That's a scene with uh, kids on jumping on bags as Frogger and, uh, across the scene. And I think we have time for a few questions. So maybe a hand of thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, you showed your uh, car craft simulation a little bit. 
So from a robotics background, usually these systems uh, tend to fail at this intersection between perception and planning. So your planner might assume something about a perfect world that perception cannot deliver. So I was wondering if you use the simulation environment also to induce these perception failures or whether that's really specific for scenario testing uh, and whether you have other validation arguments for the perception side. Very good question. So. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, the simulator obviously enables you to simulate many different layers in the stack. And one of the, one of the hardcore engineering problems is to uh, actually properly design your stack so that you can isolate and test independently. Like, like any robust piece of software, you need to have, uh, to have good APIs and layers. So we have, we have such a layer uh, in, in, uh, in our system between perception and, and, and planning. And the way you're right, the way you would test perception is more by measuring the performance of your per, of your perception system across more of the real miles, and uh, and use and tweak uh, the the output of the perception system with its mistakes. So having having a good understanding of the mistakes it makes and reproduce those mistakes realistically in the new scenarios you would come up with uh, part of your simulator to uh, realistically test uh, your planning side of the, the planning side of the house. Great. Right. Thanks very much. Um, you talked about the car as being a complex system um, and it has to be an industrial product that is being conceived at scale and product, uh, produced at scale. Do you have a systematic way of um, creating the architectures of the embedded system? You have so many choices for sensors, algorithms. Each problem you showed has many different solutions that's going to create different interfaces between each element. So how do you choose uh, which architecture you put in a car? That, that's, that's true for any complex uh, software stack. Um, so there's a combination of different things. Uh, so the first thing, obviously, that I didn't talk too much here, uh, but is around uh, the vast amount of research uh, that we do at Waymo, uh, but also we do in collaboration with uh, Google Teams uh, to actually um, understand even the, what building blocks we have at, we have at our disposals uh, to, to even play with right? and, and come up with those production systems. The other piece uh, is obviously the one you decide uh, to take all the way to production. Um, so you're right. So the, the, the two big elements here, I would say the first one, I mean, the main element, frank, frankly, is, is in your ability to, um, uh, so that, that's, that, that search actually uh, uh, will uh, takes a lot of people uh, to get to, right? So, Something I try to say is that uh, to really part of the, the, the second 90% is your ability uh, to grow your team uh, and, and essentially uh, grow the number of people who will be able to, to productively participate in, in your engineering project. Right? And, uh, and that's where the, the robustness we need to bring into our development environment, our testing uh, uh, is really key uh, to be able to, to grow that, that team at, at, at a bigger scale and essentially explore all those paths and come up with the best one, right? And at the end of the day, the, the robustness of testing is, is the judge. Right? That's what tells you whether an approach works or not. It's not a philosophical, a philosophical debate. Thank you for your talk. Um, so the car is making a decision at every single stipe time, you know, on direction and uh, speed. And part of the reason why you have the simulation is so that you can test that those decisions in every every like possible scenario. So once self-driving cars become um, you know production ready and out on the streets, do you expect that the decision will be made based on prior understanding of every single situation which is possible, or can the car make a new decision in real time based on its seen understanding and everything around it? So at the end of the day, it's uh, the goal of the system is not to to build a library that, that a library of events that you can reproduce by, one by one and make sure that you encode. Uh, you know, the analogy in machine learning would be overfitting, right? It's like if, if you if you if you encountered five situations, uh, I'm pretty sure you can hard code the perfect thing you need to do in those five situations. But the sixth one that happened, if you don't generalize, actually is going to fall through. Right. Uh, so the, the, really the complexity of what you need to do is extract uh, the core principles that make, that make you safely drive right? uh, and, and have the algorithms learn those principles rather than the specifics of any situation. Right? Because as you said, the, the parameter space 
of, of a real scene uh, is infinite. Right? It's like, uh, that, uh, so we try to fuzz that a little bit uh, uh, with, uh, with the simulator. Right? What if the cars went a little faster, a little slower? But the goal is not to enumerate all possibilities and make sure we do well on those, but the goal is to bring more diversity to the learning of those general principles that will be learned by the system or will be coded in the system uh, for, for the car to behave uh, properly and generalize when a new system, a new situation occurs. Maybe a couple more questions is okay? Okay. Fantastic talk. One of the questions I had was you mentioned the difficulty of identifying snow because it would come in many different shapes. One of the things that I immediately thought of was, I know it was just an urban legend, but it was that urban legend about the Inuit having like 150 different words for snow. And you mentioned um, embeddings of objects. Do you think one possible approach might be to create a much wider array of object embeddings for things like snow? I mean, if you're, many different types of snow could actually have pretty different uh, impacts on driving, whether it be just like a flurry or if it were to be the uh, kind of like a really heavy blizzard like we, we just had. Yeah, I, I think from, a, if you look at it from, a, from an algorithmic point of view, that, that may make sense. But the, maybe something I, I'd like to emphasize a little more is the, the very hard line to walk is to walk the line of what's algorithmically possible but also uh, what's um, uh, computationally feasible in the car, right? Uh, I think, uh, so two, 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 two points on, on, your, on your remarks. So um, um, d d if we had the processing power to process every point or every, every to, that, to a large level of understanding uh, and had the computing power to do that, maybe that would be an approach, uh, but that's, that would be very expensive uh, and, and that's a hard thing to do. Even more importantly, uh, Having, uh, for instance, it wouldn't make sense to have a behavior prediction on every snowflake of, of the things you see on the side of the road, right? And, and you need to group, uh, that's the whole point of segmentation, you need to group um, what you see into semantic objects that are likely to exhi exhibit a behavior uh, as a whole and reason at that level of abstraction to have a meaningful uh, semantic understanding that you need to, to drive, essentially, right? So, uh, yeah, it's an in-between. Last question, make it a good one. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so if you're using perception for your scene understanding, are you worried about like adversarial examples or things that have been demonstrated? Um, or do you not believe that this is like a real world attack that could be used for perception-based systems? So generally speaking, yeah. I think, I think even, beyond, even before adversarial attacks, Errors, I mean, errors can happen, right? Uh, and errors happen at, uh, in, in every model. So I think a prime example of that, which is not adversarial, uh, is the reflection case. Right? It's like, yeah, you could as well have put a sticker on the car, on the bus, and say, ah, you're confused. You think it's a car, it's not a car. Uh, but you don't need to put a sticker on the bus. It's like uh, the real life already brings a lot of those examples, right? So, so really the way out uh, is two ways. The first one is to, uh, to have um, um, sensors that complement each other, right? So uh, I try to emphasize that, but the, uh, uh, really uh, different sensors or different systems are not gonna make the same mistakes, uh, and so they're gonna complement each other, and that's a very important piece of redundancy that we build, we build into the system. The other one is, uh, is also, uh, e even in the reflection case, is, uh, is, um, e is in the understanding. So, so the way you as a human wouldn't be fooled is because you understand and you know it's not, it's not a, a thing that can, that can happen. The same way you know that car reflecting in the bus, there's no way you, you can see through the bus and, of a real car behind it. So that level of, of semantic understanding is what is, is, what is gonna tell you uh, what, what, what is true and what is not, or what is a mistake, uh, an error in, in, in your stack, right? And so similar patterns apply. I would like to thank you very much, Sasha Arnoux, for coming Thanks, to MIT. Thank you.